namaste robi uh, welcome welcome to ahimsa conversations um i know you're from south africa to begin with uh, what are your earliest recollections of either the concept or the experience of nonviolence well really i don't know about an experience of nonviolence but i do know about social justice and i do know that when i was a very small child i was a major animal lover um the man who delivered milk he used to uh deliver milk with a horse and cart and there was this huge cart horse that he used to beat and i couldn't bear that so i took my friend barbara and i i was 5 and we went off to steal the horse at the dairy and then we brought it home to my house and we put it in the tennis court and my father came home and found the horse in the tennis court you could imagine how thrilled he was but shortly after that i got sent to boarding school but if you think about it that was also an act against violence and it was an act of social justice you know yes yes so i presume it must have been there and i always knew as i was growing up uh, about the injustice of south africa and i mean i joined the anti apartheid movement but i can't say that i was any great hero you know it was so dangerous there um and i was a kid and stupid and you know did silly things um which have, could have had very serious consequences mm. because in those days you could disappear for 180 days and all together yes so it was really not very clever of me that's right uh, you mentioned that uh, you have an ancestor who worked with gandhi could you say a bit about that his name was herman kalimbas and um he actually walked with gandhi from peter maritzburg to johannesburg which was one of the first major walks with with the new movement and he gave gandhi his first farm in in near johannesburg i think and they became very great friends and he actually went to india with gandhi and um he wanted to leave all his books to uh, gandhi and gandhi said no you should leave them to israel interesting and when did you move to israel i came in 1967 to save israel in the six day war and landed up working in a chicken house on the kibbutz and <laughs> that was my major war effort was fighting with the chickens who didn't want me to take their eggs but um it was a time when you know i knew instinctively that what we were doing that it would be such a wonderful time after the war because by the time i got here it was like 6 days the whole war i i thought what an extraordinary time now to give back all the occupied territories and how that would be such a wonderful way to make peace um i thought i was very clever But you see I didn't grow up here my life was never in danger here I didn't understand what it was to build mass graves and and to be in fear all the time and have all, most of the arab world uh, declaring war so that was very clever of me to tell everybody what they should be doing when I really didn't understand and sometimes this is a problem mm. because we tend to give advice when we don't really understand the culture and in those days i didn't understand the culture and there was such a euphoria uh of no fear after the after the six day war that you know stand why i don't agree with the fact that we occupied and have stayed there and i think it's very bad for israel for our moral fiber but i can understand in a way why there was this huge euphoria after the six day war yeah did the holocaust uh, the nazi period shape your childhood or your teenage years in any way the memory of it well you know my father would never allow any german products into the house if i even bought a pen you know that came from germany he would break it and throw it away but my my parents came from germany but long before the holocaust uh, my grandparents and partly from lithuania 
So, of course, every Jewish child grew up with, with the stories of the Holocaust, and in Israel, it's even more so. It's sometimes used politically, which I find offensive. But no, uh, if you do not understand that part of the Jewish history, you will certainly not understand the DNA of fear, yes. which is very prevalent. And fear leads to violence, violence leads to hatred. And we all know where that leads. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Robbie, I know that your current work is shaped by a terrible personal tragedy. Uh, your son, who was studying uh, to be a student of philosophy of education, um, he was a student of philosophy. He was killed by a sniper, and that is, I, as far as I know, the event that got you involved in the parent circle. Um, and I'm, I don't want to make you talk about it again because you have spoken about it so many times. But was there something in the life you had lived up till then that prepared you for what you said to the man who brought the news? Because I, and I, and that I would like you to say here again. Well, you know, it's very interesting. South Africa must have had a huge influence, especially the whole Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I remember seeing a film called A Long Night's Journey into the Day. And that was about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And it was after David had been killed. And I remember I just, you know, I went to bed for three days and I couldn't face the world after watching that. And, um, it was, it was written on the wall what I was going to do. I mean, when David was killed, uh, the, the army came to tell me he was in the reserves. And I apparently said, you may not kill anybody in the name of my child. Of course, I don't remember that. But I, and I knew almost immediately that I was going to do something to prevent other families from experiencing this pain. Because, you know, I'm a fixer, but this you can't fix. So you choose, what are you going to do with this pain that stays with you daily? It never goes away, it's always there. Do you harness it to make a difference? And looking at the world today with so many thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have lost family members from the pandemic, and you should, I mean, India is in desperate straits now. I think to myself, if they look at the work that we do in the parent circle and they see how people can harness their grief to make a difference, then maybe that would get them out of bed in the morning instead of dying with your family member who died because that's what happens, not physically, but many families just disappear, you know, with, with loss. And so it's a choice that you make. Yeah. And I, I didn't know what the framework would be but when a religious Jewish man came to talk to me, and I think he was a bigger bulldozer than me, and I keep saying that's very hard to find. Um, he invited me to come to East Jerusalem to meet other bereaved parents. And that's where I met Palestinian mothers, specifically the mothers what got to me. And I looked at them and I realized that, you know, we stood over the grave, the tears were the same color, and the pain is the same pain. So why, you know, if we could stand on the stage and talk about nonviolence and reconciliation, wouldn't that be the most powerful example to people who heard us? Because we're the least likely people to do this. Yeah. And so that's what became my life really. And um, it took over my life. This whole organization has taken over my life from morning to night. I, um, it's just something that when you believe passionately inside of you, that, that you can watch change and that you can see transformation in people and that you can be a part of somebody's transformation, that's such an honor. And I'm so grateful for being able to do that and to bring a message and to see people suddenly realize, you know, that through an emotional breakthrough, yeah. that they can they can also harness their pain into something positive and not into revenge and hatred. 
That's right. So that's really been my life, you know, in the parent circle, where more than 600 families. And what we really think is that for any future political peace agreement, there has to be a framework for reconciliation. Otherwise, we'll just have another ceasefire until the next time. And this is, you know, we're doing a workshop now together with Ireland. It's really interesting, the uh, advantages of Zoom and Glue, but you can do all kinds of things that you, you know, for a lot less money. And um, watching on Zoom, six Protestants, six Catholics, six Israelis and six uh, Palestinians, all talking about victimhood, you know, how people um, hang on to being victims and why. Why do people remain victims? Is it because they're frightened if they give up being a victim that's being disloyal to the person they lost? Or maybe they won't remember them? It's very complicated. Yes. But being a victim holds you back in your life forever. You know, the, the, the moment that I realized, firstly, I realized also immediately that it was one Palestinian that killed my son, not the whole Palestinian nation. And so that enabled, enabled um, an association which was far above conflict. It became family almost with the people that I met in the parent circle. And um, I understood once I wrote a letter, you know, after they captured the man who killed David, that's when life really became difficult for me because, you know, when there's no face, you can make all kinds of remarkable statements about peace and love and read rubbish poetry and do all those kind of things. But do you really mean it? This is the test. The test is what do you do now that he has this face of this man? And I really didn't sleep for a very long time after they came to tell me they caught him because suddenly I realized I can't, I have to walk the talk. You know, I can't do this work if, uh, if I'm not willing. And so I wrote a letter to the family and two Palestinians from our group delivered it. And they were very shocked as you can imagine. I told them who David was and I told them about the parent circle and the work that we do on the ground in both places. And I said, we should meet. We owe that to our children and grandchildren. And um, they said, if everybody signs on this letter, then there could be peace. But, and I, and that they would give it to their son. And I imagined like within, uh, <laughs> within three days, I'll have a letter from, from uh, Thaya, that's the name of the sniper. Of course, that's rubbish, you know, there's no such thing as instant reconciliation. And just because I am aware of it, doesn't mean that he knew who I was or what on earth I was wanting. And if he even understood what I was talking about, why should he? You know, you have expectations of people that they can't, they can't deliver. So um, it took three years and I got a letter back through one of the websites saying that I'm crazy. Well, I really, I knew that I was crazy before that and that um, he killed 10 people on that day to free Palestine. But you see, I knew that um, his parents told us that when he was a very little boy, he saw his uncle violently killed by the Israeli army. And then when he grew up, he lost two further uncles in the second uprising. This whole cycle of violence came into play. And I think, he really wasn't politically motivated. He just was uh, seeking revenge. And so, um, I, you know, it was like such a sense of freedom because that's when I gave up being a victim. That's when my life no longer was contingent on what this man does. I want to meet him, but it's not like, you know, this is not gonna stop me from doing the work. I am in integrity with myself. And so I went back to South Africa and that's where we met perpetrators and victims who'd given evidence in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And that's where I was looking personally to understand what the word forgiving means. It's a long story. Say a bit more about that, please. 
So what happened with the, with the sense of, of forgiving, I'd met this white South African uh, Afrikaans woman who I, you know, we tend to give people labels. So you see white South African Afrikaans, you know, meaning coming originally from Holland, definitely pro-apartheid, right? This is the label. But here this woman had gone to the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission and said to the guys who killed her uh, uh, daughter, I forgive you. So I thought, wow, you know, I've got to meet this lady. I've got to know what she's talking about because we, we made this whole film called One Day After Peace. And I went to meet her and I asked her, what's your definition of forgiving? And she said, for me, forgiving is giving up your just right to revenge. And then um, I met the man who actually sent the people to kill her daughter. And I thought he was gonna be some kind of monster. It turns out he's the most incredible man. And he says, by her forgiving me, she released me from the prison of my inhumanity, which is an extraordinary statement. So I, you know, I just was so filled. They, today, they have an organization where they work with, with uh, ex-combatants. She now lives in Australia and he in South Africa, but they still run this organization. And that was really what pushed me to want to complete this whole process with, with the man who killed David. And so I came back and I thought, okay, now, you know, now's the time. And I sat all weekend thinking to myself, but it can't happen because the police are in the way, the judge, Ministry of Justice, I don't have a go between. Every possible excuse that you can come up with, I just, I made that excuse. Of course, it was me in the way. So I decided, okay, I'll go talk to the Minister of Justice, which I did. And I got permission for um, a man called Basama Ramin who's a dear, dear friend, is a member of the parent circle, who spent seven years in jail, who um, watched a film about the Holocaust while he was in jail. And it was part of his transformation into nonviolence. He's a Palestinian. Um, yes. And um, when he came out of jail, you know, he started to work on nonviolence within his own community, nothing to do with Israel. And then he heard about um, an organization of ex-combatants, mainly officers, and ex-prisoners, who Israeli and Palestinian, who met up to lay down their arms and, and try a path of nonviolence towards peace. And then, unfortunately, his 10-year-old daughter was killed by an Israeli soldier. I mean, what did she have to do with the conflict? These are, this is the ugly price of what is happening. I mean, I'm talking to you on a day that is so filled with violence, you cannot imagine. So at six o'clock, seven o'clock tonight, we will stand outside in Robin Square and demonstrate against violence. But you know, like, I, I just, I can't understand how we have got to this level of you kill me, I kill you, it's just so ugly. So I asked for Bassam, uh, we started to travel all over the world and he's, what I told you, for me, he's above the conflict, this is friendship and this is family. And um, I went to the Minister of Justice and she agreed that Bassam would be the go-between. I don't use the word mediator, because I feel that when there's mediation, there's compromise. And that wasn't what I was looking for. So um, she said yes, and I could, and Bassam could be the go-between. And then, you know what happens in Israel, we have elections every five minutes. So we got a minister of just us, not justice. And um, I don't think she would have let me go anywhere near the jail. And uh, we were waiting for permission for the, from the police. And so that sort of took care of that. And now we have to wait until there will be a more liberal government. Who knows what mess we're gonna be in next week in this country, nobody knows. 
So that's more or less the story, but I mean, there are so many extraordinary experiences around. And when I say that I'm grateful, people can't understand what I'm talking about, but um, the ability to touch other hearts and to see them change their mind and understand the consequence and the sanctity of human life is so extraordinary. So what a gift, you know, my child gave me. That sounds crazy. No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. It's now 26 years, I think, since uh, the parent circle uh, and the family's forum has been working. Now, a cynic would say, oh, you've been at it for 26 years. You know, the conflict is still there. And uh, People like me would say it's a huge affirmation that such work persists uh, against the odds. Uh, so, but what is your answer to the cynic? You see, I can't afford to be a cynic. I have grandchildren. I don't want my grandchildren to experience what I experienced. I can't look at them and not think that I didn't try everything possible. And I, you know, I think there can be a solution. It's very sad to see youth who have no purpose in their life. And uh, we can thank um, the administration in America for stopping a lot of cross-border activities with Mr. Trump. And we can only hope that we will now be able to continue and that, that people, when people don't have any hope, you can never have peace. It's a very important equation in, in the idea of peace. And so all the work that we do on the ground is towards creating a process like we these ants, you know, that would create some kind of framework so that people would understand yeah. that you must have a form of reconciliation. Doesn't mean you have to forgive. You know, forgiving is a very personal thing and it's not a prerequisite in the parent circle. The prerequisite is that you believe in nonviolence, that you believe in reconciliation, and that you believe that the occupation must end because the occupation is killing the moral fiber also of Israel, as dreadful as it is for Palestinians. And believe me, it's bad. But what does that do to the soul of Israel? It's frightening. Yeah. So if I'm... Am I correct in understanding that the parent circle works within each country? The Israelis work within Israel, the Palestinians work within Palestine, and then you work together as well. Mainly the work is Israel-Palestine together. Together. Okay. In other words, if, if we would do this meeting, you and I, yeah. if it was an ordinary dialogue meeting, there would be a Palestinian partner with me. Okay. When I travel all over, I travel with a Palestinian partner. When we do a workshop, it's Israel and Palestine. And it's not about bereaved people. That's not the purpose. Our purpose is to talk to the general public and using, in a way, this grief to make people understand the consequences of this lunacy. Yeah. Do bo on both sides of the border, do you face opposition? Because I know that in some countries, peace groups face opposition from those who are do. deeply embedded in the conflict. Look, the only thing that I will not, uh, I will not get into arguments with other bereaved parents. I think they have every right to commemorate their child, the, whatever way they see fit, as long as they give me the same courtesy. We have, for instance, every year on Memorial Day, we have a joint ceremony. It's Palestinian Israeli, and it's Memorial Day for Israeli soldiers. So already that is politically, uh, what would be the word, difficult. There's another word which I can't think of. But if you think about it, you know, uh, soldiers are like the holy cow, you know, of, of of Israel. So to do that, it's controversial, but it's a wonderful opportunity for people to see and hear stories from both sides. This year, like a month ago, we had 250,000 people watching the ceremony online. 
that's 250,000 hearts that had never heard stories from both sides. And so I'm so pleased to be a part of that, you know, and that's a privilege. It is, it is. No, it's also a testament of uh, the amazing uh, consistency and persistence with which you have all worked. No, Ruby, I have one difficult uh, challenge that I struggle with a lot, that how do such efforts grapple with the reality of the will to power that dominates the nation state? Because uh, whether it is Israel, Palestine, and or India, Pakistan, or America and China, uh, the will to power uh, that has got concentrated in this entity known as the nation state sometimes seems so overpowering. How, how should we grapple with that? Look, you can't, you know, you can only do what you can do. You can try to get to an amount of people that will change the political picture. And so you can't give up, you know, it's like tempting. Look, I'm an endangered species. I could stay at home and you know, sit it out and knit sweaters, although I don't know how to knit, but it's a choice that you make. And I'm not willing to allow the dark forces to, to invade my life. And so whatever I can do to stop the violence and to change people's minds is what I will do. Probably, you know, that'll be written on my tombstone. <laughs> Whatever I can do, I did. Yes, yes. Which is saying a huge, I mean, that's very large. And in fact, we know from our, you know, history that great shifts in human society have happened because a few individuals have done what yes. they could. Indeed. Um, moving towards the closing part, uh, Ravi, you spoke about how insidious victimhood is. Um, from your drawing on both your personal experience and the work that you've done as a group, what are some of the clues that you would give? Because you, you know that this is a universal problem. Um, and, uh, and it is often, I can tell you from India that it is actually sometimes the more privileged group that feels victimized. But of course, because there's fear. Yeah. You're so, taking away my rights, I, you know, and now in America, it's really interesting because all of a sudden there's an uprising of black Americans and there's the Hispanic Americans coming in and wait a minute, I'm white privileged, what are they taking away my jobs? You know, that's a fear of what, of what can happen. And um, we have to just find a way um, to alleviate fear because I think that's a lot to do with, with victimhood and fear comes from not knowing. And I promise you that if Palestinians and Israelis would really get to know each other, there'd be nothing to fear because we are so similar, it's funny. And I would imagine that India and Pakistan, oh, yes. if, only, if only they could take some of the lessons and some of the projects that we do, and they would do those projects together. It would be incredible. See, a lot of the work that we do on the ground is very much, it's possible to export it with, I was in Sri Lanka and um, we spoke a lot about the projects that we do in the current circle. And they were so aware of how they could adapt what we are doing to find out and create an emotional breakthrough. And mainly the emotional breakthrough comes through personal stories. You know, you don't have to have a dramatic death like I had. Everybody has a story. And even if they don't, you have to ask them about their grandparents or their name. And then all of a sudden, the whole story will come out. It's so incredible. I remember that uh, when I was in Sri Lanka, we went to, we did a workshop with a lot of um, families who didn't know what happened to their, to their children. And, but next to me was sitting a woman and I could see that she wanted to tell me something because I told my story. And that is the beginning of a workshop that opens up a safe space for people to, to talk. And I asked her what, and she said um, she lost her son and her husband. 
And of course, she told me the whole story. I just stopped the workshop and I decided this woman's never told a story before. And I just let her talk for maybe half an hour, you know, and it was so incredible because she, it was very graphic because it's the first time that she told the story because the more you tell your story, at some point you talk about the person who died and not, and not how they died. That's another step in healing. But the next day she came into the workshop and her whole face was that clean, you know, that sense of relief of being able to tell your story. So a lot of the work that we do, or most of the work that we do, is storytelling. Has there been, you've been to so many parts of the world, have you encountered a reality that seemed even more difficult to grapple with than your own everyday challenge? Or is it really the, that the essential challenge is the same everywhere? I think everybody thinks that their conflict is the worst conflict and can never be solved. You know, if you look at Ireland, Ireland has been like hundreds of years with this drama and they still haven't solved it. Yes, they have a ceasefire, yeah. but they don't have peace because they haven't gone through a reconciliation process. There's no honesty in what happened or admission of crimes or uh, some form of, um, what's the word? Uh, giving some, what's the word? I'm, I'm looking for a word. Reparations? Or, oh, compensation, reparations. Uh, and, and reparations. Compensation. Yeah. You know, there's nothing. Uh, I thought that Bishop Desmond Tutu had uh, anchored a truth and reconciliation process in Ireland. Was that not deep enough, not wide enough? Uh, no, Desmond Tutu never, uh, you know, he always, I love Desmond Tutu, okay? But yeah. one of the things that he did is to force people to forgive. And you cannot do that. It's immoral, actually because you can't make people shake hands and then they go out of the room and they're horrified with what they did. It's a long process of them being, I love the whole work of restorative justice, but it's very delicate. You can't force people to do things. Mm. You know, they need to be ready and they need to want to, and they not because in the heat of the moment, they say, I forgive you or something like that. Yeah. And for the rest of their life, they resent that. And in the beginning of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Desmond Tutu actually wanted through his religion for people to forgive. And that was absolutely not a good idea. So people like Alex Borain and, and the people who were involved in the Truth and Reconciliation said to him, that's not, nothing to do with, the, with us. Yeah. Forgiving is a very personal thing. So, there was no clause in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission about forgiving. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was about getting to the truth and giving amnesty. And that was the only way they could get the truth. You know, and if somebody wanted to forgive, like this woman I told you about, that was very personal. Yeah. You mentioned that you're you're in the middle of an exercise uh, with the uh, Irish. Uh, Catholics and Protestants. Yeah. Can you say a bit more about what is the effort in that exercise and, and what you're hoping to do through it? You know, it's about victimhood. The whole workshop is about victimhood. I listened a lot. Uh, we had one Saturday morning um, an introduction without the people who are participating from Israel and Palestine, but I observed this workshop where they told their stories. And the stories are horrific, but it happened like 40 years ago. And the way that they tell it is as if it happened yesterday. And, and that's being stuck in victimhood many ways. I don't want to judge, it's not my, you know, um, but I think that sometimes Basam, the man I told you about that I want to be, uh, to uh, be the go-between between, between me and the sniper always says that the Palestinians are the victims of the victims. You know, it's this, it's a brilliant idea because that's what happens, you know? And so um, when I look at Ireland, I remember the first time that, that I went there, I was always so 
um, in, I thought I'd be so inspired by this whole process. Whereas I discovered there was almost an industry of victims. So they weren't working together to, to end this anger, which is like, there's lots of anger. And I don't know if you've been to Belfast, but have you been to Belfast? No. They have what they call the peace wars. On every wall, there's like written about somebody that died and was killed and, and it's all uh, graffiti and the Catholics have Palestinian flags and the Protestants have Israeli flags. Now, I mean, they haven't got enough problems of their own. They have to now take sides. And it's just, you know, I keep saying to people, please do not be pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. You take our conflict, you import it into your country and you create hatred between Jews and Muslims. Is that what you want? You know, it's not, it's people love to take sides. It makes them feel good about themselves, but they're not helping. If you want to help me and support what the work we're doing, then talk about looking for reconciliation. Don't tell me how terrible the Palestinians are or how cruel the Israelis are. I actually already know that. But let's try to find a way, you know, to reconcile, to, to admit crimes, to, you know, to do all of the things that a reconciliation process requires. There were many things in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission which were not good. They did not um, nurture the victims who I call survivors, but they didn't nurture them enough after they'd given evidence. It's difficult. All of the things are, are, you know, and the compensation that they should have been given, you know, it's, it's complicated. It is, it is, it is. And, and yet uh, the very fact of the effort has a uh, definitely a, both a past historic significance, but I think it's, uh, uh, it's, these are the learnings from which we can build, I hope. So, Rabi, in closing, uh, I would ask you to share what advice you have for young people uh, in fairly uh, much less complicated situations, actually. The young people I'm thinking of, uh, actually, for them, COVID is the first real trauma that most of them have dealt with mm -hmm. in India. You know, the world is going to be in a trauma, and these young right. people yeah. have never known. So that's much right. bereavement. Yeah, that's and a, a, maybe an uncertainty, both of course, you know, and so there's also a lot to blame, you know, and yes. the angry part. Yes, but yes. Maybe if that that energy could be put in a way of supporting, of supporting people who have suffered this terrible loss. I'm sure there's hardly a family now that doesn't know somebody. That's true. That's true. And actually, there has been an outpouring of volunteer effort. Uh, a lot of it by very young people who are risking their own life, actually, both in yes. offering relief to the hungry because who are affected by the lockdown, relief and rescue for the ill. And uh, uh, there's some heroic work happening at cremation grounds as well. Uh, the advice I wanted you to share is uh, that um, I find many young people having an impulse where their rage wants to express itself through some form of violence. And then I also see them pulling back and saying, I know mentally that, or at least morally and ethically, that that's not the way, but nonviolence looks so difficult. It's so daunting. So uh, what advice? What Inner strengths can they cultivate to cross this well, hurdle? I don't know. That's a really difficult question. And who the hell am I to tell people what they should be doing? I'm not a big giver of advice, but I do think um, if they understood the consequence of what happens from violence, if they understood, you know, kids think they're invincible. It's like the kids that went out in, in Palestine, 14, 15, with knives and get shot and die, you know? And then you think to yourself, it's not them, it's the family that's left without a child. 
when they understand the sanctity of their own life and that it's not, you know, and that taking the life of another and being angry and being violent has terrible consequences, not only that they might get arrested or whatever would happen, but the consequences of their action and maybe they get killed and how would their mother feel? You know, and how would they affect the whole family and all their friends? Don't they see that it's valuable not to be violent? Thank you so much. Bless you. You're most welcome. Thank you. Thank so you. Maybe we meet in India. We never know. <laughs>